34. And it says, For ye are yet carnal. Sorry. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, starting at verse 3. Amen? Amen. 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 So it says, verse 3, For ye are yet carnal, for wherefore there, for whereas there are among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? For one saith, I am of Paul, and another saith, I am of Apollos. Are ye not carnal? Come on, let's read that scripture again. For wherefore are there divisions? Are you not carnal and walk as men? For while one saith, I am of Miami Heat, the other saith, I am of Los Angeles Lakers. For one saith, I am Dwayne Wade, another saith, I am of LeBron James. All these sports that we get involved in are just another way of divisions being instilled in the church. Mm -hmm. Now that one came out of nowhere. You never knew I was going to talk about sports here, huh? But there's games, Seventh-day Adventist churches have sports teams that play against one another. And when you go to some of these games and you see people get in fights, and you understand that this is the realm of church and that the purpose of the mystery of the gospel is that Christ may gather us all together in one. Have mercy, there are divisions among us. Have mercy. I want to show you something very interesting that I see. And this is the common English Bible, and this is Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 to 20. I know I never put it there, but I have some moment for some individuals. Can you, can you it ran out of battery. What? It ran out of battery. It's okay, I'll yell. <laughs> Galatians chapter 5, this is the common English Bible. I want you to take note of this. It says, I say, be guided by the Spirit, and you won't carry out your selfish desires. A person's selfish desires are set against the Spirit, and the Spirit is set against one's selfish desires. They are opposed to each other, so you shouldn't do whatever you want to do. But if you are being led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The actions that are produced by selfish motives are obvious, since these include sexual immorality, moral corruption, doing whatever feels good, idolatry, drug use, casting spells, hate, fighting, obsession, losing your temper. What? Competitive opposition. Conflict, selfishness, what? Group rivalry, jealousy, drunkenness, partying, and other things like that. I warn you, as I have already warned you, that those who do these kinds of things won't inherit God's kingdom. Now, why does the common English Bible translate these words as competitive opposition and group rivalry as being the work of the flesh? Now, if you go on a website called Blue Letter Bible, you can go to the actual Greek words and see the Greek definitions of the words. Now, I want you guys to go to Galatians chapter 5 and read from the original text when you go home and see what the meaning of all those works of the flesh actually mean. And I guarantee you that you will see competitive opposition and group rivalry. Now, this is a work of the flesh. And Paul says something as sturdy as those who do these things won't inherit God's kingdom. Have mercy. And yet, our whole church, our schools, are holy and gross within this thing. You know, but when I talk to my friends about this, you know, sometimes they say, well, doesn't Paul refer to athletes or games within the scripture? And I say, okay, let's go to some scripture to see the times where he talks about this. Let's go. Second, Second Timothy chapter 2. Second Timothy chapter 2. Second Timothy chapter 2. It says, verse 5. No way. Second Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5. It says, And if a man also strive for the masteries, yet he is not crowned, except he strive for lawfully. Now the masteries entails sport, entails these different competitions. So here is Paul saying, yes, you can go play sports. No, he's saying a man that striveth for the masteries is not crowned as, unless he strives lawfully. So strive in the context of this chapter is talking about the masteries, correct? So now in the same chapter in verse 24, 25 and 26, Paul says what? Look in the same chapter, verse 24. And the servant of the Lord must not strive. Is he talking about, I, sh I shouldn't strive to be the best that I can be? No, but in the context of, but in the, context of the chapter, he's talking about striving for the 
mastery. Now let's look at one more, one more piece of evidence. Let's go to 1 Corinthians very quickly. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. First Corinthians chapter 9, and starting at verse 25. Amen? Amen. 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 So here it says, And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. We have that same theme. Now they do it, they. Notice how he makes a, distinguish, a distinction between us and them. He says, Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. But we are incorruptible. I therefore so run, not, not as uncertainly so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep my body under but I keep my body and bring it into subjection, lest lest that by any means when I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. Now before we continue reading, I want you to know that when the scripture was first written, there was no such thing as chapters and verses. It was just a whole long text. There was no divisions. So here we're going to see what the context of what Paul is saying is. We can continue to read on in, in chapter 10. Amen? Amen. So now in the context of Paul talking about someone striving for the masteries, look at what he continues to say in chapter 10. He says, Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant. So after him, him speaking about the sports, he says, Brethren, do not be ignorant. And then what does he say? How that all our fathers were under the cloud and now passed through the sea, and were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and did all eat the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Go on to verse 7. And then it says, Neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink, and rose up to the water. Rose up to play. In the context of striving for the masters, Paul likens this rising up to play as idolatry. Now, where is this? This is the book of Corinthians. Paul is writing to the people in Corinth. Now, Corinth was in Greece. Now, I want to show you in Acts chapter 17 and verse 16, another thing that Paul said about the people in Athens, which was also in Greece. Amen? Let's go to Acts 17 really quickly. And don't fall asleep on me yet. I'm almost finished. Acts 17 and verse 16. Amen? Amen. Amen. It says, Now while Paul waited for them in where? Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw this city wholly, not partly, not in some aspects, but wholly given to idolatry. Now remember, we just read in Corinth that they were idolaters. We know that Corinth was in Greece. We also read in Athens that they were wholly given to idolatry. We know that Athens was in Greece. Now one question, Olympia. Where was Olympia? Olympia was always, or was in Greece. Now do you think that there's any connection between Olympics and idolatry? Let's go really quickly. I took this off, you know, I, I did a screenshot on the computer, so we can all see that I took it from the Olympic website. Amen? It says, and I don't know if, if we can see or not, but it says, according to the historical records, the first ancient Olympic Games can be traced back to 70, 776 BC. So way back. So we know that when Paul was in, in Greece at the time, that the Olympics was going on. Amen? Amen. They were dedicated to the Olympian gods and were staged on the ancient plains of Olympia, they continued for nearly 12 centuries until the Emperor Theodosius decreed in 393 AD that all such pagan cults be banned. If you were a Christian and you were participating in these games, it was like unheard of until they were banned. What does it say? It continues on. Olympia, the site of the ancient Olympic Games, is on the western part of the Peloponnese, which according to Greek mythology, is the island of Pinos. The founder of the Olympic Games imposing temples, votive buildings, elaborate shrines, and ancient sporting faculties were combined in the site of unique, natural, and mystical beauty. Olympia functioned as a meeting place for what? For worship and other religions and political practices as early as the 10th century BC. The central part of Olympia was dominated by the majestic temple of Zeus with the temple of Hera. 
parallel to it. Now the Olympics, were, it wasn't for fun or recreation, as some people might say. No, it was all for idolatry. That's all that it was for. Even if you look at how the Olympics are every four years. Now there's some cyclic cycle. You know how long it takes? Four years. You know what that torch represents? That sun. Why do you think that, that person runs around the track in the direction of the sun right before the Olympics starts? Brothers and sisters, all these things are heavily linked to idolatry. Look up all those logos of all these sports teams. Put them in, in Google. Look up all these logos. They are all idolaters, cultures, pagan practices. Have mercy. I want to show you this video. Thanks for watching. I know that the volume was kind of low, but the point of the video is we have people in the church even today cannot tell you anything about the sanctuary, but they can tell you every single player on a Miami Heat roster. You have certain people today that couldn't even tell you a favorite Bible verse, but they can tell you every single stat of their favorite basketball, soccer, or football player. Look at what I look like. Satan is delighted when he sees human beings using their physical and mental powers in that which does not educate, which is not useful, which does not help them to be a blessing to those who need their help. While the youth are becoming expert in games that are of no real value to themselves, are of no real value to themselves or to others, Satan is playing the game of life for their souls, taking from them the talents that God has given them and placing in their stead his own evil attributes. You want to know where competition started? Go to Isaiah chapter 14. Satan, Lucifer, was proud in his heart and said, I will ascend into heaven and be like God. You want to know where competition started? It is his, it is his effort to lead men to ignore God. He seeks to engross and absorb the mind so completely that God will find no place in the thoughts. Now how many times when we're watching that Super Bowl, it was just Thanksgiving, how many times when we're watching that game do we really think about the Lord? Now are we vulnerable in these positions? Remember, as Seventh-day Adventists, we have a unique message. I truly believe, and I can't vouch for anyone else, that there's going to come a time when there's going to be a people that will have the victory over sin. Now if we really analyze our life 
and we see all these things, aka this dross, do we truly believe we can participate in these things and have the victory over sin? I'm not here to tell anybody how to live their life. But if anybody wants to be honest with themselves, when you're in front of that TV, or when you're playing those games, ask yourself, how is it with my Lord? You honestly think that the Lord's character, the Lord's law, His glory, can be written in your forehead while you are partaking in certain things. Do you want to know why the Lord said foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests? Do you want to know why? Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 13. And I'm closing here. Ezekiel chapter 13. The man wanted to follow Christ whithersoever Christ went. And Christ said, foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests. Well, what are foxes? Let's go to Ezekiel 13. Ezekiel 13, in verse 1, it says, And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Sorry. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel, and say unto them that prophesy out of their own hearts. Hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, Woe unto the foolish prophets that follow their own spirits, and have seen nothing. O Israel, thy prophets are like, What? foxes in the desert. So these prophets that prophesy out of their own hearts, that follow their own spirit, that have seen nothing are like foxes. Now what's wrong with prophesying out of your own heart? Jeremiah 17 and verse 9 says that the heart is deceitful above all things.